um, first rename yourselves and then second, um, we have a poll for you to fill up while we are waiting for the room to fill in. Thank you for those from the Be Fantastic Within Fellowship. Thanks for being here. Um, we realize it's short notice. For those who are not part of the fellowship and are here, a big and hearty welcome to you. And yes, we're really curious as to what you're looking for while you're here. We'll give it just a minute more before we start. Looks like we have a lot of artists in the room. some researchers, some technologists and enthusiasts. I guess we're all enthusiasts. Uh, so welcome everybody, whichever hat you're wearing. And so big warm welcome to Creating Tech Art, AI and Performance. This is really, really exciting for us um as it's the first dialogue in our this year's season of conversations around ai and the arts um and this is part of something called the be fantastic within fellowship and so really really excited to launch that um space of convening exploration experimentation with all of you here today A quick shout out to all our partners and supporters who have made this possible. This is our third annual fellowship. Um, we at Be Fantastic have run two others before, and this year we have partnered with Future Everything. Really happy to be involved with Future Everything that aligns with what we are up to here in India while they're there in Manchester in the UK. Uh, we'll get into a little bit more about what we each do. We also are really excited to partner with our old partners, STEM Natya Dance Company, um, and our supporters, British Council, also supported by the Prohelvetsia and Goethe Institute, and a big shout out to Dara, our communication partner. So, um, who is Be Fantastic? We are a tech art platform. We orig originated in 2017 with a really big festival that we did in Bangalore in India, where we wanted to really showcase how the disciplines of art and technology come together and uh, what happens when that, that kind of coming together takes place. And with that, with the excitement that we generated in 2017, we've been going down the path uh, for, the, for those last few years which through COVID has now pivoted into this online space where we're able to convene kind of larger global communities. Um, and we've had some successes. Uh, it's a messy process when we collaborate across borders, but at the end of the day, I think we keep coming back to it despite all of that, because really what comes to bear is worthwhile. 
uh, both for us as a team, as well as the artists who are uh, in space with us. Um, and then I hand over to Irini, our partner director at Future Everything to tell you a little bit more about Future Thank you, Kamia, and uh, welcome uh, everyone from me as well. And it's great, it's great to be here and we're very excited to be collaborating with Be Fantastic and uh, a company and everyone else uh, on this project. So uh, Future Everything, you, some of you might uh, know as uh, being a long uh, running uh, festival, digital culture festival in Manchester, like it's been around since 95. Uh, and in the past few years, we um, decided to move away from the festival format and we've been running year round activity of uh, projects in terms of like engaging, engaging with digital culture, uh, thinking about the big questions around technology and society and how technology has an impact on society and also supporting artists and working with arts organizations and artists from um, not just Manchester, uh, Great Manchester and the UK, but also internationally to develop uh, projects and exhibitions. So we're looking forward to working with all the fellows here and of course to be part of the dialogue sessions, which this is the first um, of the in the series. Uh, and I'm just going to quickly, shall we uh, have a, um, an intro from uh, uh, Madhu about company as well? Is Madhu, are you going to do an intro about that? Or quickly to say, uh, Irini Madhu has her time, so maybe she can treat. Okay, um, I, I can just, hi, hi, so. Irini. I'll just say a quick hi to everybody and Namaskar, welcome. And uh, I think I have a given been given a slot of ten minutes to talk later, so we will do that then. Great, Great. Thank, you. Madhu. thank you. Okay, so uh, going to our next slide, just to say what um, this program uh, is about, uh, basically. So, so why we're why we're here and. Um, uh, future, uh, future fantastic is uh, is a year long uh, ambition, uh, ambition, uh, ambition activity, ambitious activity, which is uh, will be culminating in in a festival in Bangalore in March next year. But in the meantime, reaching to the festival, we will have a series of fellows the, of the fellowship program, of course, a series of commissions and uh, like critical conversations and engagement, not just with people who are part of this program, but also with wider uh, audiences. And um, as I said before, this dialogue uh, today is just part one of a series of events. So please uh, keep an eye for, if you're not part of the fellowship program, keep an eye on the updates and uh, postings for what comes next. And Kamia, do you want to um, follow up with the fellowship? Yeah, so just a quick note about this fellowship. We have um, participants and mentors from UK, Germany, and India. Um, this time, the last two, two times that we ran the fellowship, we've had um, artists, technologists, researchers in the room working towards making collaborations between AI and art. Uh, and a lot of that, a lot of it that's come to bear has been more on the visual art part of it. So this year we decided to explore how performances can come together with AI as some some form of AI uh, explorations within that. So that's really what Be Fantastic Within is all about. Um, and over the next few months, you'll see some of the works come out, and we hope to finally showcase at least three to four pieces that come out of this fellowship at our festival. So really exciting. Stay tuned for all of that. And to the fellows in the room, can't wait to get this started. Uh, a little bit more about our speakers today. Our speakers are mentors. Today we have with us Madhu Natraj, founder and director of STEM Dance Company. Uh, she is an award-winning choreographer, arts entrepreneur, curator, and educator. Madhu believes in populating the public domain through the expressive and transformative power of movement arts. She has collaborated with important design, cultural, philanthropic, corporate, and academic organizations, performing in and traveling in over 50 countries with over 300 choreographies to her credit. Madhu trained in Kathak and Indian classical dance under her legendary mother, Guru Dr. Maya Rao, 
and studied contemporary dance in New York. In 95, she founded STEM, Space Time Energy Movement Dance Company, comprising verticals of training, performance, documentation, and outreach. She also heads India's premier dance education center, the Natya Institute of Kathak and Choreography. Madhu is an old friend uh, of us, both at Be Fantastic and our work before at Jaga. I think for us, Madhu embodies the um, enthusiasm and ambition to embrace new challenges. And she'll talk a lot more about that. We've done some really interesting collaborations with Madhu and the STEM Natya Dance Company, and she'll go into that in detail. We also have Jake Elvis, a media artist living and working in London, although Jake today joins us from New York. So thanks, Jake. I know it's really early for you in the morning, so really thank you for your time here. Um, they studied at the Slade School of Fine Art, UCL. Recent works explore their research into machine learning and artificial intelligence. Their practice looks at poetry and narrative in the success and failures of these systems, while also investigating and questioning the code and ethics behind them. And this we really hope you bring strongly to the fellowship, um, Ajik, because I think that's really one of the elephants in the room, the, you know, the ethics around using AI for practices. Their current work in the ZZ project explores AI bias by querying data sets with drag performers, which simultaneously demystify and subvert AI systems. We also have um, Bjorn Lengers and Marcel Kanke, a fringe theater group which aims to bridge the gap between classical theater and new digital media like virtual reality. Their project Cyberwobber um, started May 2016 and has now opened up the work with other theater creators and artists, adding to their repertoire. They show their work as theater installations, as plays you can visit. And um, they showcased their work in Bangalore last year. And I think some of the folks in the room have visited it and have found it really compelling. So we really look forward to having you in, in our midst. Uh, just to say Bjorn and Marcel are from Germany. So here we have a really exciting representation of uh, our international mentors. With that, uh, I invite Madhu to share her screen and tell us more. Hello, everybody, again, and those of you who just walked in, um, came into the Zoom room, Namaskar, as we say in India. Uh, I really believe in the endless possibilities that the movement arts and somatic practices offer us, you know, from not just being a medium of expression, but of transformation and of healing. And I think at this point, uh, since our whole fellowship revolves around climate change. I think it is important because of to not look at land by itself or the earth by itself as a resource to extract from. And that's exactly how I look at dance as a teacher. So uh, that's uh, what we're going to do. We're looking, we're going to tap into various uh, wisdom streams as well as look at how the geopolitical, socio, uh, conditions inform our art. So um, I was born in a family of artists and I um, studied Kathak as Kamya told you earlier, which is a Indian classical form from Northwestern India, which is also the precursor to flamenco. Um, and the two forms, you know, really mirror each other. And at a time of divisive politics around the world, I think, um, uh, it is time to acknowledge, as we are starting today, uh, that the arts, technology, dance transcend all barriers, whether they're social, racial, or political. And um, my journey into dance, um, being born in a family of artists, you would imagine that I would probably become a dancer. But by the time I was 15, I was completely saturated. Uh, because uh, I think this is a familiar scenario with most of us. 
you know, you have a show or you have an exhibition uh, or you just presented something and you come home and a whole lot of artists meet. And this was something that happened in my home every three days, great artists, philosophers. And after a couple of um, strong beverages, everybody would uh, speak about the politics of dance and the art world. And I used to say, I'm going to support this from the outside. And so then went into a completely different trajectory to study management and uh, journalism and um, also uh, commerce basically. And one day I had a life changing experience and I'd like you to be part of that. Uh, I went to the American Dance Festival and uh, in New Delhi it was the only time it happened. And uh, none of the Indian classical dancers, this is way back in 1990s, early 1990s wanted to go. So I went there and um, just so that I could meet my friends in Delhi again. And then there was this woman standing there uh, who became my guru later, Sarah Pearson. And she said, um, all of us were dressed as was the fashion of those days in leotards ready to learn. And she said, um, well, I just want you all to take your index finger and create 10 movements with it or 30 movements with it. We really thought she was off her rocker. So let's, let's give it a shot. I can see some of you. So, I mean, if you were to take your index finger and beyond, you could give me the first one, maybe. First movement. Okay. There. Irina? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Combo. And by the time anybody else wants to, Kartika, you want to go? Okay. So, yeah. So, each of us, she, she made each of us come out there and say, you know what? Can you, can you demonstrate? And when I went there, she said, you're a choreographer. And I was thinking, whatever. And then she said something that has become a strong pillar of my life. And she said that with just three joints in your body, if you could create 30 movements or 10 movements, can you imagine all the various joints in your body and the permutations and combinations? Will you ever be short of creating movement? And that also reminds me of the space we are in, which is AI, you know, with the little data and permutations, the possibilities are endless. And I took it one step further and I said, you know what, will I ever be short of creating? We have to choreograph our own lives as we wish to. And from day one uh, with the STEM dance company, our, which stands incidentally for the precepts of choreography, which is space, time, energy, movement. So using space and time, um, you know, uh, to create movement using energy. Uh, that's the STEM. Uh, and about 10 years later, STEM became something else. Most people think we're a STEM cell research company. Some of them think that we're into, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but this is what our STEM stands for. And before I begin, I'm going to ask Kirti to show you a quick 45 second uh, video, uh, which just looks at the variety of work we do Pardon uh, the, the slight flashiness of it because this was created for event marketing companies, uh, you know, who have zero um, attention span in a sense, right? So this looks at our work, both in the classical and contemporary realm, and also um, using unconventional spaces like malls, etc. Uh, I will just start you off with that so that you don't tire of hearing me talk. Thank you.
Thank you, Kirti. So um, just to give you an idea, and I will um, just wanted to also introduce you to our work that when we started, when we started 25 years ago, uh, the first ever production we did had six collaborators. And, you know, at that time, I was, you know, in my early 20s and uh, bringing a new form into Bangalore. Now, of course, Bangalore is like the contemporary dance capital of India. But believe me, in 95, um, I was getting questions, which is, uh, why is a good classical dancer standing on our head or talking about sexuality and LGBTQ issues and, uh, you know, sustainable development it just didn't make sense. And it, it, it meant ostracization for some time before the audiences came forth and said, you know what, we are talking about something that's relevant to us today. And um, one of the first um, pieces that we worked on, um, I think if they can play it along at the same time, is uh, way back in 2002, we created for an international design meet, a piece that was about the timelessness of Indian design. And those of you who have been to India will notice as you walk out, you know, even a completely uh, uneducated person can draw sacred geometry in seconds outside the house. And it was about the timelessness of Indian design idioms, ideology. And um, that was the first time we worked with interactive multimedia. And this was really new in 2002, uh, 2004 uh, in India. And this is the concept of the mandalas, which are you're very familiar with, I'm sure, as designers and artists too. And it looked like looked at the panchabhuta or the five elements, earth, air, water, fire, and the most metaphysical of them all, space. So although it was rooted in Indian mysticism, um, it, it looked at utilizing interactive technology. This was, uh, I'm talking about 17, 18 years ago. So thanks, Vicky. Um, and then onwards, uh, the collaboration we first did with Jaga is, I don't think we have photographs of that, but when Jaga first built their space, which was a uh, which could be moved from place to place. So the very first one, uh, I did a piece uh, using, working with the architecture of that space. And uh, then uh, was a piece called Bajra. And Archana uh, created a multimedia work with us. You know, again, this was about the, um, how shall I say, the, the, the Im immortal spirit of, uh, the, the immortal immortality of the spirit, which is likened to a diamond, which is Vajra, which is also, uh, you will see it in Tantric Buddhism as the Doji. And in, of course, in, in Indian spirituality, it's looked at as a, a sign of indestructibility. So that was the idea of the cosmic womb of atmospheric waters, which is carbon. And uh, uh, there is a piece that Keith is going to show you, which is interesting, and Archana and I worked on it, and it was the idea of the 108 is a mystical number. So 108 cut diamond, which is the Valanda, and uh, using that, we created the architectural floor plan of a duet. So he's going to share that. Mm -hmm. After that, we did another project. Uh, it was really exciting. A lot of my our graduates, our students have worked because, you know, Kamya and Archana will come up with something and they say, you know, we have a residency, uh, uh, you know, hosting somebody from Germany or somewhere else and can we create, we're doing something on a flyover and can your dancers do something with film and, uh, you know, movement. And so we, we're constantly creating things. So, I mean, just as we are at the same time with artists, with writers, with um, uh, technology, uh, people from the from the corporate world also and policymakers. So I'd, I'd like to concentrate more on the work we do with Jaga and uh, uh, 
you know, future fantastic can be fantastic. So I'd like to just show you a couple of pictures of uh, uh, be fantastic way back in 2017 was India's first ever tech art festival uh, as started off as a Biennale and we created a piece on unicycles. Uh, and also I remember the, it was also AI enabled and uh, the dancers were in a sense moving to their own. Unfortunately, I don't have some pictures, but we did it at, at the Bangalore Metro station. So, um, and um, it, was, it, was, it was called Jangam, which uh, means uh, momentum taken from a 12th century concept of movement. Do we have any more? Mm -hmm. All right, so, um, and then, uh, yeah, I'd like to show you something because since we are working towards, if you can, somebody can just let me know how much time I have left. Three minutes, okay, great. Um, so we have, uh, we had a very interesting artist, a filmmaker, uh, and also photographer who worked a bit like Cindy Sherman because she, she would put herself in spaces and create imagery. And uh, she came to us wanting to do something on the philosophers across time and imagine bringing them into a present day scenario. But she was a first time visitor to India. And the moment she came, uh, there, was, there wasn't culture shock, there was environmental shock because she saw the traffic here. And she said, where are the green spaces? Because she comes from a very green part of Germany, as you say, as he plays it. This was trying to look for green pockets in, um, in Bangalore and look at this lost connection with nature that we as city dwellers, especially dancers working in a proscenium have lost. And we worked with her over a month looking for green pockets in our city, thinking color of our city, a metaphoric of the world is green. Um, so I'll just leave you to watch this for a bit. Great. Thank you, Kirti. Yeah, so just wanted to show you, in fact, we've had about three or four posts, especially from Gothe, who we've done some very interesting work with the last person who was with us. We did a piece uh, reviving, um, you know, uh, a sort of genetic memory almost in Bangalore's old, um, you know, um, central prison. Uh, and uh, that was another work. And with Jaga, we have done several other projects. And over here, we're looking forward to, you know, moving from the space of what is rhythmic to what is algorithmic in a sense, and uh, create new work. Uh, the dancers in the company uh, also, they study both traditional Indian wisdom streams and also are trained in Indian martial arts and contemporary dance and uh, are open and porous to working. And uh, even in this uh, residency, sorry, in this fellowship, I'm also looking at exploring mm -hmm. both areas, working from uh, anthropology to movement analysis to creativity as an imperative 21st century skill. And um, I think I'm going to end with that and um, we will get to know each other better and we have a QA and a too. I think we're out of time, so thank you. Thank you so much, Madhu. I guess um, it's good to just plug it in here that uh, your enthusiasm for non-proscenium based spaces is really exciting and I hope we can push that boundary as well through our fellowship. Not everything has to be on stage. 
we can look for really interesting locations to you know have performing arts go beyond the stage like the middle of the traffic <laughs> we need to talk more about that so bravo i hope more of that happens jake can we hand over to you take us down your story <laughs> hello um i'm jake jake elwes and yeah it's it's fairly early for me in, in new york just flown in here um but happy to be joining and um yeah, so I'm, I'm a, a media artist, um, conceptual artist working with machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I have been doing so for the last five or six years um, since I was at art school. And my art school was quite a sort of traditional conceptual art school, which actually now I teach at a bit as well. Um, but I guess for me, it was finding that conceptual richness within some of these models and papers coming out of companies in the US and, and institutions and universities and finding interesting ways of subverting them or finding poetry in them or maybe doing things with some of these algorithms that the scientists that created them maybe never intended for them to be used in that way. Um, so yeah, I guess my journey started at a place called the School of Machines Making and Make Belief in Berlin, where I met a wonderful educator and, and AI artist called Jean Kogan. Um, so yeah, let me share my screen with you guys. Um, and then I can show you, walk you through just a couple, a couple of my works. Um, so yeah, let's, let's have a look. I guess, I, yeah, I wanted to start with, um, with this video and this video is actually I don't know, maybe thinking more about the, the humans and the people behind some of these algorithms. And I think often we tend to, I don't know, mystify artificial intelligence um, and, and kind of possibly direct our focus in the wrong direction along lines of singularities and kind of fear mongering. Um, and for me, actually, the, the longer that I've been working with these processes, the less interested I've maybe become in kind of the agency of the machine and artificial consciousness and these sorts of questions, although these are still things that fascinate me, um, but maybe more interested in social inequality in them and, and who's building these systems and who are they building them for and to serve. Um, so this is a little video of some of the most powerful and influential figures in tech um, speaking in numbers. So this is, I suppose, a little performance video which has been created uh, using the machine learning algorithm. Um, to isolate the numbers. So let me play a little, little extract of this. 1 billion, 130 million, 100 million, 2 billion, 1, 200. 250, 70, 1, 10,000, 150, 10,000, 18,000, 10, 16, 16, 16 2, 350, 20, 100, 2, 2, 2, 20, 350, 50, 10, 50, 9,000, 9,000, 1,000, 1, 6 billion, 100 million, 100 million, 100 million, 600, 1, 100 million, 1, 1, 10 billion, 5, 30 million, 1, 3, 2, 27 million, 2, 100, 1, 1, 5, 30,000, 0, 1, 10, 10,000, 10,000, 3, 3, 3, 3 Three or four hundred billion, one trillion, three hundred eighty to three hundred fifty thousand, three hundred fifty five, four, four, twenty, ten, or one three trillion, seventeen, four hundred trillions, and five millions, one tens of thousands, millions, and five hundred billion, fifteen, four six trillion, two million, five thousand, fifty billion, sixty four, fifty five, one billion, eighty, forty, ten, zero, three, four hundred million, four billion, one four billion, nineteen eighties, one, one four billion, nineteen eighties, three hundred million, ten, fifteen billion. 13,000, 1,500, 1,500, 25 million, 1 billion, 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 2 billion, 2, 7 billion, 4, 4 billion. Right, I'll stop there on <laughs> Mark, <laughs> um, but it, it goes on. So I guess, yeah, as, as an artist, um, I kind of came to to this field, I don't know, I don't, you know, I've been programming, but, but that's not my background um, in data science. So when I learned about some of these techniques and tools, I kind of, it fascinated me on a conceptual level um, and an artistic level. So some of the concepts that I originally got introduced to, which I'm not gonna go into depth now because I feel like that could be a couple of hours of kind of talking through the conceptual implications of some of these things. Um, but I'll briefly talk about three of the concepts that, that really grabbed me when I first discovered this field. Um, so I guess this was about 2015, 2016. So it was before deep fakes were even really a thing. Um, a deep fake being a way of creating a 
fake body, um, you know, feeding your own movement into Donald Trump's face and, you know, face swap and these sorts of technologies that we've seen become popularized through social media platforms um, and in the news. So these are the early days. Um, so I guess, yeah, three quick concepts. Convolutional networks. So a convnet is effectively a computer vision algorithm for understanding images. Um, so obviously as humans, we do this, you know, quite straightforwardly. Um, our brains have a, a large part dedicated to image processing and understanding the world around us. Um, so in a way, this was a very complicated task for a computer to be able to understand that this is a pen, but you know, this is a pen from a different angle and all of these images with different backgrounds, they all have something in common. Um, so we kind of do that with layers of abstraction using a neural network, um, which, which kind of goes through these images pixel by pixel and starts to understand more and more abstracted features of them. So once you've got this, you could feed it a whole data set a neural network of images of, let's say faces, and it will start to plot these faces and say, okay, now that I've understood what this face looks like, I'll give it this number, maybe 512 numbers. Those 512 numbers can be thought of as a spatial coordinate. And this is again, a really beautiful concept for me. So this is the idea of a latent space. So this is kind of the fundamentals of all machine learning and AI uh, or deep learning. How do we understand and categorize things and kind of plot them in this space? Um, so, yeah, you can sort of see here this diagram, you know, it's not actually a three dimensional space, it's a multi dimensional space, but this red area down here might be kind of female looking faces, and the area up here might be male looking faces. But then I'm quite interested, you know, in exploring as an artist looking at queerness, kind of what, what happens in between this, in between gender and in between sexuality in these latent spaces of everything that a machine learning algorithm has learned. Um, and I've got to whiz through because I've actually got a few slides and not that long to talk through them. Um, but I'll go into more depth on this later, but basically, yeah, then from there, you can take a point in this space and create a new imaginary image. image. Um, and this is something that really excited me as an artist. So the first experiments that I was doing with this were like a reference to Namjoon Pike, who's the pioneer of video art and media art. Um, and this is a piece where the Buddha is looking at a CCTV feed of the Buddha. It's this rather beautiful Zen kind of feedback loop. So we created, me and the collaborator, Rowan Arnold, a Buddha looking at a generative network trying to create an image of the Buddha, but failing to do so, because this was in the really early days, 2016, before these algorithms were very powerful. We didn't have enough training data. We didn't have enough computing power. Um, so that was one of the first pieces with this. You can see this is the computer trying creating a representation of the Buddha. Uh, I'm going to run through these. This is kind of exploring these latent spaces and getting them to have conversations with each other. So this is one where I pitched a language model against a image model and tried to get it to communicate with itself and see which kind of strange routes it would go down. Um, then on to the next piece. I'm just going to talk about this piece and then quickly move on to my final piece, which is the project I've been exploring for the last few years. So this project was quite fun for me. Um, thinking about how we can reframe and recontextualize artificial intelligence, and in this case, in nature. So kind of thinking about, about, about bio, um, biodiversity, and for me, actually thinking about nostalgia of a specific landscape. So this is a landscape on the Essex coast in the United Kingdom, a place that I've been going since I was a small child, um, and one of the places with the most diverse um, varieties of marsh birds and wading birds. So for this, I trained a neural network on different birds and it starts to invent new species, new images of species of marsh birds. So you start to see kind of part of the curly used beak and then the body of an oyster catcher. And for me, these are really kind of exciting and beautiful to see the computer imagining these interspecies. Um, so what I did is I took them out and plonked them in the mud and projected them across the landscape with the actual physical birds behind. Um, he also had a, a soundscape that was also generated using machine learning. Um, 10 hours of field recordings, which then a machine learning algorithm tried to mimic those data. Get 
the idea. So then finally, on to the last project, um, this is the ZZ project. So thinking about queerness and performance and effectively how to challenge the idea that with AI systems, there's often a bias, a bias towards cis white men, basically often American engineers that have created these data sets or these systems. And I suppose, you know, trying to think about how we can inject otherness into this algorithm. How can we force it to see something which is other? And for me, being part of the drag community and the queer community and the cabaret scene in London, uh, it seemed like a perfect way because drag is all about constructing an identity, which is, I guess, challenging society's notions around gender and around male and female. So drag kings and drag queens and drag monsters, drag kings being women actually performing masculinity. Um, so thinking about that, this is, these are all deep fake faces from a few years ago. They've got even more realistic now. Um, so I took this model trained on 70,000 faces and injected a thousand images of cabaret performers, burlesque performers, drag kings, drag things, drag queens, <laughs> queerness. And it came from these images to these images here. So you can see they've kind of all turned into these rather beautiful, the faces have started to break down the features. And you can see a video here as well of it moving through the latent space of everything it has now learned from drag faces. So kind of dirtying or corrupting a normalized standard data set and taking you know, the weights in that neural network into a space of otherness, of queerness. So I've slightly run out of time, but I'm just gonna briefly talk about this because this is most relevant to performance. So here I'm working with 13 of London's top drag performers, cabaret and burlesque performers. This is Lily Snatchdragon. And what we did was we created deep fake models of each of their bodies. And the way that you do that is you create an image data set and you turn it into a skeleton, and then you train a machine learning algorithm to get really, really good at turning these skeletons into bodies. So this is the training process. You can see from the left, that's kind of the neural network in its infancy stage, turning into a more realistic representation. And then from there, you can then feed any new movement in and control that body. Um, but for us, there was a whole thing here about consent and ethics, who's controlling whose body and what does that imply? Um, because that's, that's the thing with deep fakes, it's normally exploitation. It's controlling someone's likeness without their consent. So here we wanted to fit that. So I'm going to stop there, but you can see videos of ZZ Show where they're actually performing lip sync and performances to you online. Um, ZZ.ai, Z-I-Z-I. -Z -I. I think I've got a, a link, yeah, Z-I-Z-I -Z -I like this. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Can't wait to get more questions across your way, but um, I think it was really exciting to know that you were an artist who doesn't code or didn't know how to code and program, and here you are. So that gives the rest <laughs> of us a lot of hope. <laughs> yeah, well, I do the coding. I do do the coding now, but yeah, <laughs> it, took, it took a while. Yeah, we, I think that's, that's what some of us are here in the room too, to see like, where do we go from here? So good to hear your story. Um, Marcel and Bjorn. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you. So Marcel and me, uh, we are actually in this, basically the same room or in the same apartment at the moment. I will make the, the first maybe five minutes of this uh, little introduction into our work. Uh, and then Marcel will continue. Um, thank you for having us. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so we started to work together in 2016 and we started to work together um, in the field of virtual reality and theater. So this is where we come from. Um, we were mainly interested, uh, I would say the starting proposition in what we did was um, to find out if we could transform or transfer a you know a med well it's not a medium an art form um, in onto a new totally new platform so uh, virtual reality um, that's where we started from so to play theater if you will in in virtual reality uh, to experience it also there but um, starting from there we very soon understood that working together with other theater artists um, the first of all what interests them 
first of all, is the stage and um, meaning the physical stage also. And um, so we saw that there's basically a huge, let's say, demand or urge to um, to to actually also use those technologies like virtual reality on stages <clears throat> and to use them as a creative instruments or as instruments to to somehow um, go through to understand better the world, the digital realities, if you will, of our time. So um, um, suddenly we were not only the people who were doing theater in virtual reality, but also using digital technologies in all kinds of different theater contexts. And this is, you know, in the context of what we are talking about here now is where we um, at a point in a project where we did our first opera um, in virtual reality, we realized um, what kind of artistic potential um, machine learning or artificial intelligence in a way um, has for, for our work and also for the stage work. And um, this is where we, well, we started with this whole concept of what could we do in machine learning um, to, to inform the stage. So the real, the classical, the, the, the physical uh, stage. And um, so I will start a little video in the background of my uh, of my image here. This is when we started uh, to um, to think about how we can we bring dif different uh, artificial intelligence algorithms or ways to create visual, musical, or even text art uh, onto stage. And this is when we started with um, Prometheus Unbound. Uh, which you see in the background here. Um, it is an evening on a stage um, shared with an audience. So that was pre-pandemic times, um, um, which is created in real time by machine learning. So um, most of the visuals that you see here are um, created beforehand, um, but the text of each evening is created uh, in real time by, um, by a neural network, GPT-2 at that time. Um, so um, the interesting thing here was that our actors, our two actors, basically were like humans on a wire. So um, they never knew what kind of play they would have to perform each night. Um, they they had a kind of a structure that we that we gave them and that where we helped them with, but basically the text is created and then fed into another neural network uh, to translate it because GPT two was a uh, neural network that basically worked very well in English, but not so well in other languages. And we are of course um, working basically mainly in the German speaking world, which is small, Germany, Austria, and parts of Switzerland. Um, so we had to translate it into German also. And uh, then we had another neural network that uh, a speech to text, a uh, text to speech algorithm that read this whole text that had just been created and translated to them. And then they performed it. Um, yeah, and this is basically something I will um, go forward a little bit. Oops. That's the same video. Um, that is something that we are trying out in other contexts also. So these are images from our uh, latest um, production, Der Mensch ist ein anderer, The Human is Another, where we um, built on the, on the findings of the earlier project. Um, um, and we use GPT-3 this time, which is a far more uh, advanced um, neural network for text generation, which actually can speak German, which um, helped us to get rid of the whole translation process. And we actually tried to really do theater scenes. So to have different roles, to have dramatic um, dialogues, to have, um, to try out in a way, all this stuff that you might see on a traditional theater stage. And this is basically why Marcel and I are at the moment here in Ingolstadt, because we are trying to do another uh, iteration of this basic idea, 
um, um, a project, we, it's just a one-time performance, a durational performance of 12 hours. We call it Mensch am Draht, human on a wire. And basically we will have uh, the team of Prometheus Unbound that you saw earlier perform for 12 hours nonstop in the city of Ingolstadt. Um, and we will, uh, so we won't cu curate this uh, in any way. We will in a way um, free the algorithms to do what, what they do, what they want to do, you cannot see because uh, of course no persons, um, but, um, and, and see where it takes us. So this is something that we are at the moment preparing and why we are working here. And uh, I would go over to Marcel. Yeah, and what I would like to add, um, what Bjorn forgot to say, that the text generation algorithm, since a lot of things in our lives are actually text, I would actually wager that nearly everything is text in a way or can be captured in text. There's also the possibility now to generate choreographies. So what you're seeing right now in this video is we just gave um, the system a prompt to generate a certain style or way of choreography. And then it just generates commands that are audible. So the actors and actresses can hear the commands and then they follow. And so you can actually um, auto choreograph uh, stuff and test things out. And by changing the prompt, the way you ask the system basically to compose these, you can have a lot of fun, so to say, because it also, um, let's say it commands you to do things with your body that are not humanly possible sometimes, but still it's very interesting to see how people try to adapt to these commands. So yeah, Jan, are you moving to um, the, the next project? Um, yeah, the cyber ballet. That the idea behind this was actually uh, twofold. The one thing that we're thinking about is that artificial intelligence nowadays doesn't have a body like us. So it's uh, quite uh, deprived when it comes to sensory input. So what we thought about was actually how would an AI try to understand our human, our natural realm? And so we created a narrative that we want to have a longing artificial intelligence that wants to see and understand our realm by actually seeing people move in space and interacting with the space, what it, what it feels like to have a body in a way, and how would that actually enrich the AI's capabilities in different ways. And so we constructed actually a narrative to use virtual reality to um, give people prompts in a way and to animate people. So people that are not trained dancers necessarily, but actually just lay people like you and me to be um, invited in the cyber ballet, to dance together with professionals, to dance together with the artificial intelligence, with movements that are capable and capable because the AI still learns to move because as it has no physical body, there is no gravitation in virtual reality and you can, can go beyond and uh, above. And so we actually tried to use um, the headsets and the virtual reality in a way to inspire movement and to cue people to move and to show movement to the artificial intelligence that was ever observing, that was ever longing to have a body. So that was um, the cyber ballet in essence. Bian, do you also have um, some stuff from digital motions? From the, from the follow-up project. Yeah, from then on, we actually re really liked the idea to use virtual reality as a extra space, as another space and place, and to actually think about um, building a laboratory in a way, because that, the cyber ballet was quite narrative driven, but with digital motions, we actually wanted to give people a kind of um, access panel to different kinds of uh, motions and also to different kinds of visualizations of motions. So what we really did was we were looking at how would motion be depicted if you wouldn't have a body, if all you would have is traces, if all you would have would be light, if all you would be having is a flashlight that draws basically around you the light. Because in virtual reality, you are not limited by batteries and you're not limited by the space itself, but you can rather invent motion and you can invent, um, a, let's say, a kind of booster for motion that can visualize um, certain aspects of the human body that cannot be accessed. And the most beautiful thing and where I believe that AI, virtual reality and the arts intersect very strongly is the fact that motion is a three dimensional thing. So whenever you as a dancer, you, you move, you conquer space. And whenever you sit in front of the dancers, you are not really sometimes able to perceive the complexities of the spatial relations. But with virtual reality, 
we don't only control the space, but we also control our perspective that we have on top of um, the actors and actresses, but we also have control of time, which means we can slow down or accelerate, we can duplicate, we can do so many things that are long in the realm of the computer. That's where it gets very interesting. And through virtual reality, we also gain access to different kinds of artificial intelligence driven systems and we can actually enter them now we can kind of enter the computer and see it through us and that's a core principle of us as cyber robber. we really want to connect human beings to technology funnel that stuff through us uh, we are a very capable system so to say and see what happens what kind of perspectives can we gain and what kind of things can we learn how can art enrich technology but also enrich the general human um, experience thank you Thank you so much. Um, I guess what you're showing us is really the epitome of blurring of boundaries in all sorts of ways. Art and performance and theater and technology and human and artificial and, you know, really a lot to unpack. Um, all I can say is that with these three unpacking of practices, I am getting a shiver down my spine. Um, and I do hope everybody in, in the room is. I'd like to invite Irini now to hold the space for, a, a, you know, to kind of convene um, our speakers into conversation. For all of you who have just listened to these three amazing practices, please get us your questions, put them in the chat and we will collate them and direct them to the speakers. You will also have an opportunity to unmute yourself and ask those questions. But once we have first uh, given the speakers a chance to talk to each other, yeah? Great, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, Kamia. Thank you all for your brilliant uh, presentations and for sharing your um, great work uh, and creative practice with all of us. Uh, I've just been, as you were talking, I've been thinking about some threads in all your practices. For example, you've been talking about ideas such as like from uh, finding poetry or uh, artistic potential in these uh, technological kind of uh, systems, but also subversion, uh, talking about from the rhythmic to the algorithmic. And what I've been thinking about is that actually what you have been doing with through your work is taking back the algorithmic to the rhythmic and the poetic as well, because we, we use, and I'm saying that because we, we forget that um, before, like, uh, you know, the how we are now talking about um, the algorithmic and how we call it right now, we forget that procedure similar to, um, to, to algorithmic. Uh, ones have existed since ancient times and uh, we're talking about like a way of thinking and problem solving that was that is not uh, just about computer sciences and exclusive to that but it's part of a you know of cultural uh, ways of thinking and doing of all human civilizations so like from thinking about knitting patterns thinking about recipes thinking about like you know domestic devices operation and so on just to say some like of the most uh, uh, kind of common ones but what so so just to go back to one of the presentations like the the video that jake showed us for example uh, with the people behind these algorithms say a lot about why we think about these technologies the way we think so you know just seeing like uh, white uh, males be like controlling and operating all these all these systems and war and worlds and what i find really um, fascinating and amazing is that how the work that you do and the work that that artists do and why we're here is like to kind of you know make yeah get us to think differently about what the algorithmic is and and that's what i find really powerful so about this idea of like the rhythmic and the poetic back to these technologies that we, we think as rigid and very kind of male and are very male dominated and western domi dominated as well so um i'm just going to kick start with like just one uh, the a first question and as kamia said ever to everyone please feel free to add questions to to the chat so we can bring them into the conversation um but i, I just wanted to 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 hear like from any of you like what what have been like you know the challenges but also the rewarding things in terms of like you know how you uh uh, you've been um, working with these uh, ideas and also thinking about these kind of tensions as well in terms of technology, but also things that are poetic, that are more creative, etc. So I, I would love to hear more, a, a bit more about that. 
I don't know who wants to start. Could be anyone. Can, Just tell me. I, I can start because I, I immediately kind of know what, what I really like about the stuff. Because technology is most of the time is utilized by, let's say, a younger generation. And what I've been seeing with the virtual reality um, installation operas and ballet things that we do is that actually elderly people are very interested in that. They sometimes need a kind of framework, which means the opera, the ballet or the theater, a place that they know, a place where they know the rituals. But then they actually want to interact with technology. They don't want necessarily to do this in a gaming arcade or at home, but they really like when culture is involved and technology is involved. And with virtual reality and dance and motion capturing, actually giving people, elderly for example, the ability now to move their bodies again without the constraints of being at home in the kitchen or being in a park or having to do it because it's a yoga session and you need to do it. If you have a way of using technology and actually then bringing together, let's say in a, in a weird way, lost generations, and also um, maybe going together to this exhibit where everybody wears the headset and begins to move, is kind of a freeing thing that can happen where actually virtual reality is not this isolation, isolating thing, but can actually be a social event where you begin to share. I've never seen you dance like that. I've never seen you move like that. And when we lose, let's say our natural realm, the virtual can actually offer us new and uh, different things. And when we as designers carefully craft and build these places, it can really reach everybody. And that's something that really touched me and that I really liked about utilizing technology. Thank you, Marcel. I don't know if any, anyone else wants to, to mention anything there or a different perspective or challenge. I, I, could, I could add uh, um, to what Marcel just said, because um, for me, it was actually um, witnessing um, when, when we show um, Saba Ballet. So, and we showed it in Bengaluru also. And it's so amazing to, because you don't know what people are seeing in, in you have four people, they have virtual uh, reality headsets on their eyes and they have um, headphones over their ears and they move together in a room. And it's so interesting to see what's happening in this room. So I, uh, can say that I'm, I'm sitting there sometimes for hours and watching strangers move with the, with the help of this technology and creating a kind of a new choreography all the time. And this is really, so for me, it's very rewarding. I think that was a question that you had also. So I'm, I'm really liking to, to see what happens in, this, in these rooms. Thank you. Um, I can quickly say, yeah, no, briefly, I guess, for me as well, it, it, it is, it's talking about how can we make this more accessible? I think, um, you know, art and fine art is, is quite an elitist thing. It's kind of can be difficult um, to engage with. And, and so is the field of AI, machine learning, and it can be quite complicated to actually enter into that field. So anyway, yeah, that, that's kind of why I'm really excited to explore it through a popular art form, through drag performance and cabaret performance to try and see how we can bring these different people in. And, you know, also talking about the fact that it's mostly white cis men in the West, um, you know, doing, I'm aware of the irony that I am also a <laughs> white man, but I, you know, trying to maybe challenge that. Um, and I think it needs to come from all angles and we need to kind of be pushing that in, in all different directions. Um, but also trying to use the platform to uplift different people. So that's why in a way I want to collaborate with as many different um, artists from different backgrounds in, in that London scene. Um, but it's really exciting to kind of see different people engage with it because it's dragging out for me. It's actually, that's a really lovely outcome of that. Um, Irene, since I think I'm the only one here right now who comes from embodied practice, um, I think, you know, also this time that we've all been through as a collective experience and time became both our nemesis and oasis for the last two and a half years. I think we've also realigned our intent as artists. And uh, for me, I think more than ever before, I think everyone has had felt this visceral need to connect during these sort of fractured times. And, and I think this fellowship and the mentors and everybody bring that, you know, the interconnectedness of, of, of issues and the arts. And, and for me, it is really exciting. I think I still remember the first time I got really excited about AI was, um, you know, when Merce Cunningham, you know, in his 90s, um, you know, used um, 
I think it was called life forms at that time. And he used that for movement transference, you know, so something that is so ephemeral, the evanescence of, uh, of uh, age, of youth and all of that becomes completely irrelevant, you know, with this. And for me, that's, that's very poetic. And also, also this whole concept of constantly improvising, uh, which as artists we should be doing, uh, you know, it's actually something that's almost tangible. So for, for me, it's a very exciting space. Thank you. Absolutely. I mean, there are so many, uh, there's so many questions, so many things that we can, you know, we can explore through and also that you, you are exploring like through your work here. And especially, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the, the body as well. And I think, yeah, I think Jake did mention in terms of like, you know, control and also consent in terms of the body, but also I'm thinking about, you know, the very fact that it's uh, technologies and virtual worlds and everything that we're creating with technology today is kind of shaping and impacting our bodies in like very, you know, so many different ways and, uh, and, and also in, you know, in also terrible ways as well. I mean, that, you know, in, in, in terms of like um, abuse, et cetera, in, or like harassment, but also in terms of like how we, we think about how our bodies uh, have to be. So, so it's a really, I think there are so many interesting, um, you know, like pot potentials and uh, ways that we can like think about in this context and how you work. But I was one, of, another thing that I wanted to ask you as well, and I don't know, I hope that I'm not taking questions from other people, just please feel free to drop them here. Um, it's just very, just very briefly to say in the context of what we're talking about in terms of like climate crisis in this uh, fellowship as well, uh, there is something else about, you know, how we think about our bodies in, in, in relation to the environment, to, to technology and how disconnected we are from nature. We, we think of ourselves as something separate, although we're very much part of this. And I was wondering, like, if you had any thoughts on that or in terms of your creative practices and if the, there is like, yeah, anything that you would like to bring in in terms of like thinking about, you know, the, uh, like our our humanness, our bodies are like in in the context of like you know the planetary and like this wider kind of um, uh, ecology rather than just as the the human on its own. And if you don't have any like immediate answer to that, we can just park it because I think we have we have a, a question from uh, Vicky Clark in the audience. So maybe I can I can uh, ask that as well. Uh, and Vicky is asking, do you see AI and machine learning systems as a creative collaborator or a tech tool? Does it surprise you? Yeah, um, both. I would. Oh, sorry, Jake. Um, both, I would say. So, um, uh, of course, it's a tool, right? So we, 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 um, as um, coders, artists, human beings, um, we define what is happening in a way. Um, and um, it is, of course, also any machine learning algorithm or any uh, every neural network has been created by endless amount of time, human hours, so to say, uh, and of course also been trained on data that is mostly human generated in a way. Um, but also, I find it very often very surprising and um, sometimes get really dragged into it what's happening and I'm so um, so I cannot really answer it because sometimes it's like it's talking to me <laughs> um, it might, might sound naive and and wrong in a way but um, um, this is something you know um, sitting there and getting lost in latent spaces so to say it's sometimes it's really amazing what is what is happening what is possible and what is this doing to me or to others I think this is also something that we try to do when we set it on stage we we somehow present it in front of an audience and somehow this process of you know how do we all perceive what is happening is also changing what what's what's done and somehow it gives sense to what is um, normally a senseless thing right so there's a kind of an output that is that is coming out of this uh, but by perceiving it together it somehow is something <laughs> all right so 
I feel mm -hmm. like yeah, my thinking on this has changed a bit over. over oh, sorry, my dude. Don't know. <laughs> um, I think I think yeah. When I first started working with these tools, I was so excited in these questions of like agency and artificial consciousness and how far you can push these things. But I think sometimes I think I realized that those were a bit misguided. And actually, there, there is something magical going on. I mean, it is extraordinary sort of seeing this sense of emergence. But I think it's maybe a matter of understanding where that magic is and, and what it is and trying to deconstruct that and open up this black box. Because once you can actually understand the mechanisms going on and the techniques, then I think you can really start to command and control and play with these things. And in a way, I think the strongest things happen. Because for me, I'm most interested really in, in narratives and concepts and when artists are using these things to say something more interesting rather than maybe just demonstrating the technology. Um, so I think that's often a case of finding an interesting collaboration, finding an interesting way of using the human side and creativity with this kind of sense of emergence um, that you get from machine learning, which isn't really a new thing either. I mean, that goes back to generative arts, you know, artists have been exploring randomness and emergence for a century now, but I think that there is this added aspect now that with the computing power that we have with sort of image data sets with new neural networks, you can create these things that have such a strong sense of autonomy and agency. But at the same time, you've got to be careful not to anthropomorphize it. <clears throat> um, but yeah, no, there's really interesting discussions in there. And also, really, I loved your I loved your your statement about about bodies in nature. I'm not sure if I can add to it right now, but it got me thinking. <laughs> It's something that we can think about as it we have plenty of time in the fellowship so <laughs> to come back to it. Uh, Madhu, did you want to add anything to this? I, I just wanted to actually there are some really interesting questions in the chat, but I just wanted to uh, answer what you had asked earlier about climate change and our work and i think as artists we get asked this a lot right they you know mm -hmm. and you, they're saying things like you know you're you're not creating uh you know replacing styrofoam with shrimp shell technology or you're not creating algae that replaces something else and cleans up the waters or you're not sequestering carbon what are you doing as artists right and i think during the pandemic we saw that everybody turned to the arts right and uh, when we had the time and, and 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 artists have been generous in sharing so it's not just about creating awareness but what do the arts do i mean if you just go back to the basic why are we all doing what we do you know the arts connect they heal you know and um, collaboration i think no other uh, you know, form, entity can do what we do. So I think it's a very powerful space, especially in the area of climate change too, which is in answer to your question. This is great. And I'm really glad that you mentioned that because yes, it's about, um, you know, also bringing up difficult questions sometimes, right? So that's very important in terms of like why, you know, artists are here and what arts do. Uh, so there's another, we have another question that, sorry, I forgot uh, to ask before from uh, Pratia Raha, and uh, it's asking how can the audience or people, I think you did touch a little bit on that, but it'd be great to, to, to bring it up again. Uh, how can the audience or people be made part of the performance? Uh, yes, we see a lot of interactive media now, but still it's limited to, to a, a, a very particular part of the population. So how can a person who has no awareness about contemporary art practices or AI engage? I, I would like to answer, if I may. So we're actually doing right now two projects where it's crucial that we can give people the ability, so to say, of using AI in a very, very low level way. Because our um, pieces where we do the Prometheus, where we actually connect human beings through these little headsets, to um, a real time text generating system that is totally uh, doable basically to just plug somebody in and experience the way the text that it flows, the way that you then just become an actor or actress if you want to, or if you don't want to, because you have just connected and there's this kind of, it's a little bit like drinking actually, because you have this voice now in your head that tells you what to say and what to do. And it does very interesting psychological things with you. You can actually get into a kind of flow state 
where you actually just repeat what is being said to you and you automatically then use your body you begin to act you inflect certain things and that, that are removed and you and we actually i think we are all in a way trained actors because we master our lives every day we have wear different kinds of clothes different kinds of faces whether we talk to children or we talk to elderly people or whatever so technology this technology specifically can tap into that and it also enables people that would never go on stage they now have this plug in their ear and whatever they say whatever they do they can always say i didn't say that the machine said that it came from above i'm just um, executing the orders in a way and the same thing can be said about the cyber blade where you put on this headset and you have in front of you an avatar that only you can see so the other part of the audience can actually not see what you're seeing in there and this avatar asks you to move just to give it gives you his hand and you also shake the hand and to the observer that is unable to witness what you're witnessing it looks very weird because you do things gestures movements and interact with the empty space and that's automatically a thing where we thought before actually corona hit that we wanted to take the audience put them on stage make them dance and have the audience as well observe other people dance and then later on switch to positions because then you just because it's so beautiful that you don't you're not stressed anymore once you put on the headset you're decoupled from reality and then you also don't need controllers because what we use is hand tracking another machine learning technology developed by meta facebook where you can actually have your hands in virtual reality and they are very natural in a way they react very well and all of these technologies they should actually be used to put the level of complexity at the end user's uh, perspective, the lowest as possible. It should be very natural to use your body as an interface and not use a mouse or a keyboard or shortcuts. No complicated over-engineered things, but rather really rely on actually witnessing somebody interacting with the installation and then being able to do it yourself or even be eager to do it. Because I actually forgot to mention, most of the stuff that we're doing is a lot of fun. And I think we should also not forget that fun should be put in machine learning, should be put in arts and technology as well. Maybe a very comprehensive answer, sorry. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you. If I may quickly jump in here to say that uh, thanks so much, Prate, for your question. And really exciting to hear your answer, Marcel, that uh, the audience experience really matters to you. Um, I think it matters to you, Jake, as well, and to you, Madhu, as well. But uh, from our festival perspective, it's, I, I'd like to just kind of jump in and say that it's really important to us as well. How do we make this accessible? This is not about who can pay the highest price to watch AI art or experience AI art. Uh, in the festival that we are presenting in March, we are going through um, looking at potential locations and sites in Bangalore. And this is a huge driver for us to even pick where we want to locate this festival. How can we make it uh, accessible to all kinds of audiences who can come in and interact with works, understand it, question it, cross-question it, you know, so really we're looking for that. So thanks Pratya for your question and yeah. Ranji, I see your hand up, although there are a couple of other questions, but yeah, since you want to be well, vocal. Maybe you could finish all the questions because I have a question as well. Um, I guess Sujay's question is asking whether you're building data sets from, scra from scratch, both I guess for Jake as well as uh, Bjorn and Marcel, or are you working with uh, other data? I can quickly jump in to answer that briefly. I think, I think both. Um, I think there's interesting politics to both. And I think actually when using machine learning it is a lot about the choice of, of the data set and, and where the human is kind of interjecting and, and you know, playing with these techniques and how you're using them. Um, I think, yeah, most of my previous work's actually been using pre-existing, pre-trained models, data sets, and actually then finding the failures and mistakes within that, which for me then reveals a poetry or often reveals something deeper about the way that we're building these systems, which really interests me. Um, so yeah, in the more recent projects, it's all been about obviously building our own data sets with the drag performers and the politics of doing that. 
Um, although actually linking back to the last question as well, I'm generally avoiding interaction from the audience, direct interaction, because we want to kind of create these closed systems. We're creating the data set, we're creating the movement, and we're keeping it all within the community, which is very important for us, because again, it's about uplifting a marginalized community rather than anyone jumping in and controlling their movement, which to us feels like a sort of strange body politics. Yeah, so we've, we've generally not um, created our own data sets, you can say. Uh, we did that with the movement data, but um, normally we try to use the, the networks that we use kind of out of the box, because um, that also is quite revealing. So let's say that, um, um, yeah, for the, for the movement data, that would be interesting because basically there is not so much stuff. <laughs> it has to be uh, something to be created unless we use video, of course. And Madhu, you were talking about how you had to collapse 20 years of practice into this eight minute presentation. There's your data set. <laughs> uh, but Ranji, you had a question. Yes, hi. Uh, so firstly, uh, thank you one and all for your time and uh, the opportunity as well. Thank you, Madhu, for the opportunity. Um, so I'm a, I'm a theater artist. I'd like to, uh, I'm, I'm sure at some point it will happen that we'll all get to know each other. Uh, and I'm, I've been doing theater for almost 22 years uh, in, in Bangalore, in India and outside India. So I, very often in Bangalore, you know, uh, the space that I live in, uh, theater performances that I direct and put together along with actors, uh, from the creative side, it's always, you know, interesting, exciting, unusual, different. Uh, and I've started integrating uh, technology, uh, so to say, and that's only through, let's say, projections of images and, and let's say shadow work. Uh, we haven't had uh, that great uh, an inflow of uh, technology specialists back into the theater, um, you know, in the performance space. So my question really is that one, uh, are there uh, techno uh, technology experts who are here who are also part of the project, which will make it quite exciting? Uh, and uh, two, uh, you know, at some point, uh, if that happens, then do we get to collaborate between artists and technologists? So, uh, because I haven't uh, got any uh, information on that. So if any of you could give me some information, that'll be great. Thank you. Um, I guess I can say this is a nascent space. So we do have some technologists in the room who have, uh, this is, sorry, this is a fellowship question. Uh, there, the fellowship does have some creative technologists, uh, but a lot of artists. Um, so we are a little bit imbalanced with that, but uh, having said that, I think bringing these people, we are fortunate to have who we have right now, um, because these are the few folks who really want to apply technology to the arts and vice versa. Uh, and yes, you will, the idea is that we find these collaborators and really push this space uh, through the fellowship. Um, we do have a few more minutes. Does anybody else in the audience have questions? But Ranji, we'll talk a little bit more about that maybe as our fellowship starts next week. Sure, thank you so much. I guess I have a question as you were all speaking that this domain of art and AI or performing art and AI seems so vast. Uh, do you get lost in your own latent space? Latent space itself feels kind of like an abyss of where you can swim and swim and, you know, just get totally lost. So, yeah, um, yeah keeping the AI metaphors alive, can you just tell me, where do you peg? How do you peg yourselves and framework your work? Maybe I can start because I also had an experience um, working very late and alone in front of a GAN system, a general adversarial network system that is actually generating, as Jake put out before, human faces that look photorealistic, that actually look like you would see any kind of photo when you would Google it up. And I was looking at a million faces. There was a video of an artist who put a million faces in a YouTube video, 10 hours, and you would actually see 24 or even 30 faces per second. So you should actually um, use the slider to put it down because I'm very interested 
in the vastness of these networks and how can we tap into them? How can we actually access them with our own human centered sensory system, our brains in a way, how can we enter the data flow? And when I was looking at all of these images at this high frequency that actually, I think I put it down to 10 phases per second or something, actually it became, became kind of a mesh. It became kind of a, like a new structure. And after seeing thousands of thousands upon faces, I actually began to see that I am also part of this data set because this system can run forever and it can create infinite amounts of human faces, which means we are all part of this. And it, that, that kind of gave me um, a kind of humble feeling that I felt myself not as important anymore. Because if there is any kind of system that can mathematically generate a human face or maybe a human voice and so on and so forth, or human movement, um, I am more the sum of my parts, I guess, and not only a face. And that was kind of a very interesting, very humbling experience. And I think there, there's more of that in this black, black box of AI hidden for us to see and to seek and to find. But it's still, I think the metaphor is quite clear. It's like discovering the pyramids and you only have this little crack and you can have a flashlight or maybe a matchstick and you can only light a very, very small place of the room. And from that, you interject the rest of your knowledge. And, and we really need to pray that little crack open wider. We need to give this thing actually to many, many people because there is a kind of a thing looming, I think, a kind of new dark age where we have people using AI in very different kinds of uh, ways, mostly for commercial purpose, I think. But there's also a large space where everybody should be invited, where democratic processes are actually required for people to know about this and be critical about this and um and i think that was kind of where i also set the framework where i take these experiences or where we take these experiences together and we're trying to give that to other people to kind of experience what it just means in a way to be inside a machine that is full of this amount of data and only spits out one image in the end We have a couple of more questions. I don't know if we have time to cover these. We only uh, have four minutes left, Irina. Okay, so maybe, I don't know, I think these are from uh, questions from fellows, am I right? So, so we could cover them uh, next week uh, when, we, when we start. Uh, but yeah, thank you. I just wanted to say, just since we have only a few minutes left, um, just to say, if you, a big thank you to our um, speakers uh, and like our mentors as well and for for sharing your great work for answering all, all the questions and also for the conversation and we are looking forward i mean there is such a great uh, as 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 everybody gathered there's so much so many rich conversations and so much that we can uh, discover and explore through this journey so i'm looking forward to starting on monday and uh, for anyone who is not joining the, who is not part of the of the fellowship, um, as we said before, we will be having some public facing programs. We will have dialogues, conversations that are open to everyone. So uh, keep in touch with us, and we you, yeah, and uh, we hope that you can join us in the next sessions. Um, so so yeah, so thank you from me, uh, Kamia. I don't know if you have any final things to share be, uh, before we close the session. No, I think you've said it all beautifully. Um, it's exciting to have everybody here and we can't wait to get started. So from now till the festival, we will keep throwing things your way. Um, so for those of you who are not going to join us from the next week on, we will have other opportunities. Uh, so please keep in touch. Great, thank you all. Have do, a great do fill up this little poll we have for you um, before you run away. Thank you. Bye-bye.